very brutal manner. Um, the Spanish general who was in charge of putting down the Cuban rebellion, his name is Spanish general nicknamed the Butcher, Whaler. And he was, he was nicknamed the Butcher because he was very brutal to the Cubans who were rebelling. He would put the Cuban rebels in concentration camps and there were stories of them starving to death and dying because of diseases. And the American media is going to pick this up and they're going to publish stories about the Cuban rebellion in the United States, which is going to cause a lot of Americans to want the United States to intervene in the Cuban rebellion and help the Cubans out. So there are stories like these being published in, in the United States in the American press trying to convince the people of the United States to call for their government to intervene in Cuba. But for a while, we didn't do anything. President, our president during that time, William McKinley, was very reluctant in interfering in Cuba. So a lot of these, the United States let happen, a lot of the brutality that was happening in Cuba, the United States let happen. But keep in mind, there was brutality on both sides. The Cubans did the same thing to the Spaniards. So why does the U.S. care? Why do Americans care about Cuba and what happens to Cuba, whether or not the Cuban rebels win or whether or not the Spaniards win? Just like in Hawaii, we've had a lot of money invested in Cuba. We had a lot of sugar plantations in there that American businessmen have invested in. So it's very important what happens during the Cuban rebellion because some of those investments might be lost. A lot of Americans felt like if the US government helped the Cuban rebels win against the Spanish, once they get their independence, they get to keep their businesses, they get to keep their investments. Same thing in Hawaii. A lot of Americans were just sympathetic to the Cubans. We wanted independence from Great Britain a long time ago, 100 years ago. And this is something that our Cuban neighbors are going through. They want independence also. They want to be able to rule themselves just like we did. So a lot of us in America were very sympathetic, especially people in Florida where they had a lot of Cuban relatives. A lot of them immigrated to Florida. So there was a lot of sympathy for the Cuban people. And we felt the same. We felt, uh, we felt a connection with these Cubans trying to fight for independence. And a lot of people were tempted to take advantage of the situation to eventually get what we've always wanted, which is the annexation of Cuba, especially down here in the South. The, uh, the wealthy planters in the, in the South saw this as an opportunity to grab Cuba and, and for Cuba to be annexed to the United States, just like we did with Hawaii um, in that same year. So let's talk about the causes of the war. The first cause of the war that you need to know, this is on your star, and this is going to be in your AP exam, is yellow journalism. During this time, in the late 1800s, the American press figured something out that they're going to continue to practice in the future. BS sales. If you want people to read your paper, you want that paper to be dramatic, you want it to be exaggerated, you want it to be sensationalized. That is yellow journalism. The, sense, the exaggeration and the sensualization of news. Making the news more dramatic, more sensationalized, uh, more exaggerated than it actually is. And that's how a lot of the American press attracted the readers to read their newspapers. Making things more dramatic, exaggerating things. This is exactly what happened in the United States during the Cuban Revolution. Uh, a lot of our American press would exaggerate the brutality that the Spanish um, incurred on the Cuban rebels, and they would print pictures like these trying to get the United States angry. The real reason is they want to sell their, their papers. The unintended consequences is the American public got madder and madder because this is what they saw in the newspapers and they wanted their government to intervene in Cuba and help the Cuban rebels out. So again, remember this, yellow journalism, exaggerated, sensationalistic journalism, it's going to lead this country to war. This is not going to be the last time yellow journalism is going to lead us to war. But a lot of those brutality that was depicted in the American media, the American newspapers, a lot of it were lies. 
if they were just there to sell newspapers, but it's going to contribute to us going to war with the Spanish or the Spaniards. Next, our president, William McKinley, you don't have to write this down, but you have to write this, this one down, the lone letter. Our president, William McKinley, they, he saw that there's a lot of tensions going on between us and Spain. A lot of Amer the American public were calling for him to go to war, were calling for the U.S. government to go to war. And he wanted to settle that in a peaceful manner, so he sends a letter to Spain asking them, can we ease tensions a little bit? A lot of my people are complaining that you're being very brutal to the Cubans, can you ease that a little bit? And then, in secret, one of the Spanish diplomats, his name is Enrique de Boydalón, he sends a letter to one of his colleagues in Spain. In that letter, it's supposed to be a private letter, in that letter, um, he implied that our president, William McKinley, was self-absorbed, he was a weak president, he basically insulted our president. But keep in mind, this was supposed to be a private letter to a friend of, it, of his in Spain. The letter was intercepted by the Cuban rebels, and of course, who are they going to leak it to? The U.S. The US, uh, the U.S. press. And the U.S. press got a hold of that paper because of yellow journalism. They propped it up, they exaggerated it, and it came back to the American government, and we were outraged by the letter. We felt insulted by the letter. And a lot of the American public, again, we were mad before because of yellow journalism, but because of the, the lone letter, we wanted to go to war. We wanted to help the Cubans out even more. Come in. Is it locked? Yeah. Now, so the DeLone letter helped encourage or stoke the fires of war towards war with Spain. Next, racism. Racism is always a thing. People like Henry Cabot Lodge, which is a congressman in the U.S. Um, in the U.S. Congress. He argues that America has superior culture, we have superior government, we have better religion, and America's job is supposed to be spread that around, spread that to the Cubans, help the Cubans see the light just like we did. So he wanted to spread the superior American culture, American religion, which is Protestantism, and American democracy. So he was calling for intervention in Cuba also, so that we may civilize these poor Cubans, turn them into Americans, Christianize them. Not Catholicism, because that's not Christian according to Henry Cabot Lodge, Protestantism. So spread American superiority around the globe, we should interfere in Cuba. All right, the final nail in the coffin that would eventually push us over the edge is the uh, explosion that happened with the USS Maine. USS means United States ship. USS Maine is a battleship that was stationed off the coast of Cuba. In 1898, it exploded for unknown reasons at the time. And of course, who did the American press blame for it? They blame the Spaniards for it. They blame Spain for the explosion that happened in the USS Maine. Yellow journalism exaggerated the whole thing, and even though without evidence, they blame the Spanish for the destruction of the Maine, which was the final blow for most Americans, and war is declared just weeks after the explosion happened. Again, guys, you need to be very careful about the news that you read. Make sure they're well sourced, make sure they have evidence. Any questions? So, reason for the war? Yellow journalism, they were hyping it up, exaggerating what was that going on with Cuba. The DeLome letter, which we felt insulted at. A lot of people wanted to spread American culture around the world, including in Cuba. And the final nail in the coffin would be the explosion of the main. We find out weeks later because of technology. It was probably just an accident. It was an explosion in the boiler room in Maine. But again, this was what pushed us over into war.
and the U.S. declares war in April 1898. So a lot of people suspicious about our intentions in the war. What are we doing this for? A lot of people were suspicious that the main goal of the United States was just to acquire what? More land. More land. Specifically, which land? Cuba. Cuba. So a lot of people were just scared that we're not doing this to help them gain their independence. We just want to exchange one master with another master. So a lot of people push for a Teller Amendment in the Declaration of War. The Teller Amendment is a specific clause in our Declaration of War against the Spaniards where it says, we promise at the end of the war, we're not going to annex what? Cuba. Cuba. We promise the United States has no intention of annexing Cuba, of absorbing Cuba as part of the United States. Remember that, please. That's called the Teller Amendment. We have no intention of annexing Cuba. We just want them to help. We just want to help them gain their what? Their independence. We just want to help the Cubans out. We don't want to rule over them. This is a promise that we made. It's not going to be the first promise we'll break. So let's talk about the war. Who was fighting in the war and where did it happen? The fighting during the Spanish-American War was mainly focused in Cuba, which is that island right there. But they were also fighting in another Spanish colony, the Philippines, right here in Asia. This is the Philippines right here. This is where the war started. Our American Navy destroys the uh, Spaniard Navy in Manila Bay, but they were also fighting in Cuba. The American forces were helped by Cuban rebels and Filipino rebels who also wanted independence from Spain. So the Filipinos living in the Philippines um, also wanted to become independent from Spain. Uh, they also helped the United States out during this war. So it was the team of who was fighting? Americans? Cubans? And Filipinos versus who? They're versus the Spain, Spaniards. So both the Cubans and the Filipinos thought Americans are there to try to help them win independence. They're there to free them from Spain, free them from the colonial rule of Spain, and grant them independence. So the fight, fighting took place in Asia, in the Philippines, and in Cuba, in the Caribbean. This was a highly, highly successful war. Our Secretary of State called this the Splendid Little War. You'll see why later on why this was a successful war for the Americans. And this is us flexing muscles. And this is us on the world stage. This is our debut on the world stage. And this is us getting the attention of France and Britain. You know what? We're catching up. We're going to be as powerful as you guys. All right, this guy right here, we should remember from the Progressive Era, he was a what during the 1900s? A president in 1898. He was the leader of a volunteer army that went to Cuba called the Rough Riders. This is how he gained his reputation. See, the Roosevelt actually quit the Navy, the US Navy, went to Cuba as a volunteer, along with other Americans that we call the Rough Riders, and they went to fight alongside Cubans for Cuban independence. And he's going to become a hero for the United States. So you have this guy quitting his prestigious position in the U.S. military to volunteer to fight for the Cuban independence. And he's going to use that popularity to become what someday? To become president someday. He's going to be the, the leader at the Battle of San, uh, San, San Juan Hill. You don't need to know that. Any questions so far? This is called the Splendid Little War, guys, because it only lasted four months. That same year, that war ended. The Spaniards were really, really weak at this point in their history, and we 
we made mince meat out of them. Four months, only 300 Americans are dead. Many more will die because of diseases than the actual war. But this was a successful campaign for the United States. But what's important about the Spanish-American War is what happened at the end. We get the Treaty of Paris, 1898. We've had, of, we've had a lot of Treaty of Parises in this class. They like to do treaties in Paris. 1898, the end of the war, four months after it started, the war's end. The Treaty of Paris gets us an empire, a global empire. From Spain, the United States acquires the following territories, the <coughs> Philippine Islands, Puerto Rico, which is still a ter U.S. territory today, the island of Guam in the Pacific Ocean, was given to us by the Spanish. So basically, whatever they had left over from their empire, they gave it to us. And who got their independence? Cuba. Cuba. Well, kind of. We'll talk about why. So these territories are now given to the United States. We have ourselves an empire. And some of these territories still belong to us. The only ones that don't belong to us now is the Philippines. But Puerto Rico and Guam are still U.S. territories, and this is because of the Spanish-American War. We paid them 20 million for it. Cuba becomes independent. So we got ourselves a global empire. Any questions so far? So the question is, do we give these newly acquired territories independence? Do we allow them to govern themselves, or does the United States take over them like we did with Hawaii? The answer is different for each territory. Um, the Philippines were expecting independence. That's the whole reason why we helped the, uh, why the Filipinos helped the United States out in the first place in their fight against um, the Spanish, because they thought they were there to liberate the Philippines. They were there to stop them from becoming colonies and give them independence. But they saw that that wasn't the case when the Treaty of Paris was signed. Treaty of Paris specifically said the Philippine territory will now belong to who? The, US. the United States. They did not give the Philippines the independence just like <laughs> Cuba got. Philippine, the Philippines did not get their independence. The Philippines will remain a United States territory. So the Filipinos exchanged one master to another master. Our president, President McKinley, said the Filipinos are going to get their independence eventually but they need to be civilized and Christianized first. Most Filipinos are Catholics because of the Spanish influence. So he says the Filipinos must wait. We're not ready to give them up yet. We're not ready. They're not ready for independence yet. They need to be more civilized. They need to be more educated. They need to be more um, Christianized. But we know the real reason why the U.S. held on to the Philippines. Natural resources would be one. But the real reason is location, location, location. Where's the Philippines at? Near Asia. It's in Asia. It's an Asian territory. It's right here. What's next to it? China. China's right there. What else? Japan. Japan is right there. So with the acquisition of the Philippines, <coughs> we get better access to Asian markets, and we get our presence, our naval presence, felt across the Pacific. Not only do we have Hawaii now, we also have a presence in Asia also with the Philippines. That's the real reason why we held on to the Philippine Islands. So, greater access to Asian markets. It has a very strategic location for our Navy. That's going to become important later on during World War I and World War II. 
the Filipinos are not going to take this lightly. They're going to see this as a betrayal of America. Because in the beginning of the Spanish-American War, they thought the Americans were there to liberate them, freedom from Spanish colonial rule, and they felt betrayed by the Americans, and now the Americans are ruling over them. So, Filipinos will rebel against the United States, which will start what we call the Filipino-American War. They will be led by Emilio Aguinaldo, Filipino rebel leader. Thousands of people will die, mostly Filipinos. This is where I'm from, that's why he looks like me. <laughs> you ever wonder why my last name sounds Spanish? It's because the Philippines were a Spanish colony for 300 years. All right, let's talk about Cuba. What did the Teller Amendment say? That we're not going to what? Uh, we're not going to annex. For a little bit, we did keep our promise. We gave them independence in the Treaty of Paris. But it was a fake kind of independence. We're still going to maintain some control over Cuba. If you look at this political cartoon here, we say the US government saying you are free, Uncle Sam saying you are free because of the Platt Amendment. But in reality, we have a hold on the Cubans. And you'll see why. In the Treaty of Paris, there's a little amendment in there called the Platt Amendment. And it's going to it's going to allow us to have influence over Cuba and over the Cuban government for a very long time. So the Platt Amendment, make sure you remember what the Platt Amendment is. The Teller Amendment says we're not going to annex Cuba, but then the Platt Amendment is going to kind of go back on our word. Just like how we betrayed the Filipinos, we're also going to betray Cuba. Number one, because the Platt Amendment says the United States can intervene to keep peace in Cuba. If we feel like there's bad things going on in Cuba, then we are allowed, the United States, Americans are allowed to go into Cuba and intervene. So the U.S. can intervene, being in Cuba, to keep peace. That's the wording, to keep peace. And who defines keeping peace? That would be the United States. So whenever we want to, we can go into Cuba and intervene with what's going on there. So superficially, they're independent, but we still maintain some control. Number two, if the Cubans want to make a treaty with another country, it needs to be approved by the US government. So it would be like if Mexico wants to establish a treaty with another country, and then the United States has to approve of it first. That's what it was like. The U.S. must approve all Cuban treaties to another country. Number three, a very controversial thing today. We force the Cubans to give up a piece of land for us to establish a naval base in the Caribbean. It's called Guantanamo Bay. And this is something that we still have today, Guantanamo. That's where we're going to torture terrorists, Guantanamo Bay. We still have that today. So with the Platt Amendment, the US will continue to oversee what's going on in Cuba. We might have given them independence, but that's just in name only. We have a lot of impact, and we have a lot of influence over Cuba. And the Cubans, just like the Filipinos, are not going to take this lightly, and they felt betrayed. And this is going to lead to a lot of resentment. And that resentment is going to overflow someday. And as we go through this class, you're going to see how that Cuban resentment against Americans, against the American government, is going to come back to bite, bite us later on. History is all about causes and effect. And the way that we treated the Filipinos and the Cubans after the Spanish-American War is going to come back to us. So that resentment, remember that resentment. The Cubans are going to hate Americans for a very long time. Remember that. Talk about Puerto Rico, the other territory that we got from Spain. We're going to give them limited self-rule, but we're not going to give them independence. Puerto Rico is still a US territory today. Good news is, Puerto Ricans, 
will be granted citizenship in 1970. So if you're from Puerto Rico, you're technically a U.S. citizen. You're a, US, you're a citizen of two countries, technically. You're a Puerto Rican and you're also an American. So you wouldn't have J.Lo or Ricky Martin without the Spanish-American War. this, the Spanish-American War was a turning point in the United States foreign policy. You need to know why, because this might be a question on the essay that I'm going to give you soon. The Spanish-American War was a turning point. Before the Spanish-American War, we only looked to expand where? The, in North America. We've expanded westward, manifest destiny, but we didn't look across, um, the, across uh, beyond North America. Spanish-American War is going to win us an empire, territories around the globe, in Asia, and the Caribbean. So after the Spanish-American War, the United States is going to grab territories that are not in North America. The Philippines is in Asia. Guam is in the Pacific. We're going to look to expand. Before the Spanish-American War, most of our interactions with other countries was about what? <coughs> Whenever we, about the economy. It's all about gaining more money, access to more markets. So before the Spanish-American War, it's all about the economy. Whenever we interact with another country, it's all about getting an advantage in terms of our economy, trading and commerce, opening up markets, new resources available. After the Spanish-American War, not only are we going to interact with our countries because of the economy, we're also going to look to gain territory. We're building an empire. We're going to look to gain territories now. Before, we were pretty much strictly about the economy, improving our economy, that's why we're interacting with other countries now. A lot of the interactions will lead to acquisition of more land, more territories for the United States beyond North America. So, let's look at the American Empire, Hawaii, annexed in 1898. We talked about Hawaii. <coughs> During the Spanish-American War, we acquired the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Guam. In 1898, we got to the Samoan Islands. If you don't know what the Samoan Islands are, are their islands across in the Pacific? They're, they're right here. Samoa Islands. All of them? Not all of those are Samoa. That's America Samoa right there. Is it one of them on the landmark? Like the Mariana Trench? Along the Mariana Trench is in here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And we're also going to get uh, the Virgin Islands in 1898. over here in the Caribbean. Those of you that go to vacations, that's where that still, that still belongs oh, to yeah. us. And then something we'll talk about tomorrow is the Panama Canal Zone. We're going to acquire a, a sliver of land in Panama. We'll talk about that tomorrow. You don't have to worry about that for right now. But, it's all, but now, we're gaining more territory. We're expanding abroad. Not only are we uh, interacting with other countries for economic reasons, we're also gaining more territory. A lot of these guys we still own, except for the Philippines, Panama, but the rest is still U.S. territory today. All right. All right. All right let's talk about anti-imperialists versus imperialists. There are a lot of people in the United States that oppose expansion. We call them the anti-imperialists or the anti-imperialist league. They did not want an empire. They wanted the United States to remain within the continent of North America. They're afraid of making enemies with other countries by trying to expand too far. Some of these, some of these people that don't, do not want to expand, some people you know, Carnegie, Social Gospel, uh, Mark Twain, 
Huckleberry Finn, a realist. William James Bryan, he was that populist presidential candidate that lost, but did pretty well. So these people oppose American expansion, American imperialism, American empire. They don't want to expand. But this you need to remember. A lot of them believe that this is imperialism is a spit on the face of our American values. This country was formed because a bunch of colonists decided that we need to rule ourselves. And now America is ruling over other countries, not letting them have their own governments, not letting them rule themselves. So this violated self-determination, which was the very reason why this country was founded in the first place. You got the 13 colonies wanting to determine for themselves how they're going to rule. This is a spat in the face of the Declaration of Independence that people should rule themselves. We are ruling over other people now. We're ruling over Puerto Ricans and Filipinos and people from Guam. We're not giving Cubans complete independence. So this is violating American values that this country was founded on in the first place. American values of self-determination are being violated. Next. Another reason is racism. Racism is always there. A lot of these people oppose expansion because of racism. A lot of them um, believe in white superiority, and they believe that these darker, inferior races like the Puerto Ricans and the Filipinos, what they were afraid of is what? What would racists be afraid of when it comes to imperialism? Thank you. That one day, these territories will become states, and the people living in these territories will become what? citizens. And like all citizens, they're going to have the ability to do what? They're going to have the ability to vote. And we don't want these darker, inferior races having that kind of power. That makes sense so far? Alright. Not all of them were like that, but some of them were against imperialism because of racist reasons. Next, let's talk about imperialists. We got President McKinley, the guy during the president, our president during the Spanish-American War, and Roy Jordan Kipling, we'll talk about him later on, they were imperialists. They argued for expansion. <coughs> One, for political reason, it's going to help strengthen the United States. It's going to help strengthen the United States. Why is Britain and France so strong? Because they have colonies everywhere. If we want to catch up to those powers, we're going to need our own colonies. We're going to need our own territories across the, United, across the globe. The reason why the British and the French are powerful is because they've got territories. They've got an empire. The U.S. needs to follow along if it hopes to catch up. So help strengthen the United States. Next, racism again. White man's burden. It is our responsibility to spread American culture, American religion, and American government across the globe. The Filipinos and the Puerto Ricans should thank us because we're giving them something they don't have. We're giving them civilization. We're giving them good religion. We're giving them superior um, American culture, superior American um, government, but they should be thankful in the first place. It is the responsibility of the whites in America to spread American culture because it's superior, to civilize the Filipino people and the Puerto Ricans and the Cubans. Next here that I didn't put down in here that I should have is social Darwinism. Again, these people deserve to be conquered because they're what? 
they're weak. America's strong. America's powerful. So we deserve to dominate these weaker nations. We deserve to dominate these weaker races. It's survival of the fittest, and we're the fittest. We're on the top of the food chain. So we deserve to dominate these nations. Right. And there's a lot of economic reasons as well. New markets, where we have more people to sell to. There's more people to, there's more products that we can buy. You can buy Filipino and Puerto Rican products now, and Cuban products, and we can sell to them also. We can sell to the Filipinos. We can sell American products to the well, Puerto Ricans. There's new markets now. We have opened up new markets. And we can exploit these places of their natural resources. Just like what the British and the French have been doing for centuries. Any questions so far? All right. One question that we need to answer during this time, and that America was fa facing. Should the people of these newly acquired territories have the full rights of Americans? Should a Filipino under the U.S. government, should a Puerto Rican under the U.S. government's control be given the same rights as a regular American? That's the debate that was happening during this time period. Should they have all the rights that are guaranteed to a regular American by the Constitution, by the Bill of Rights? Does the Constitution apply to them as well? That's the main question that we need to answer. Does the Constitution follow the flag? Are the people under the American flag, do they all have the same rights? Are they all guaranteed the rights that are guaranteed by the Constitution to everybody else? What do you think the answer will be? No. No. According to the Supreme Court, in what we call the insular cases in 1901, People from these territories will not have the full rights of an American. People in these territories will not have the full rights of an American. According to the Supreme Court, in the insular cases that, that were taking place in, in the 1900s, the early 1900s, the early 20th century, people in the newly acquired territories are not going to have the same rights as an American. They're not going to be given all the constitutional rights as an American. So Filipinos, Puerto Ricans, people from Guam, they're not going to enjoy the same rights as a regular American according to the Supreme Court. The Constitution doesn't fully apply to them like it applies to a regular American. That's why after 9-11, guys, and this goes back to why history affects us today, after 9-11, at Guantanamo Bay, we tortured terrorists, even though that's against our Constitution, the Eighth Amendment, no cruel or unusual punishment, and the United States government, when they were getting backlash from it, they said, you know what, back a long time ago, according to the Supreme Court, the rights do not apply to these territories. They don't fully apply, the Constitution doesn't fully apply to these territories. All right, we'll continue tomorrow. Expect a quiz tomorrow. Guys, I can't give you your notes right now, the printer's broken. Expect a quiz tomorrow. We'll finish it up tomorrow. If you haven't done your homework, that's due tonight. I'll try to. I will be at it.